Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 8th of January 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with your daily gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, we'll be talking about the NVIDIA Project Shield, a surprise announcement at CES, and that will be taking up the entire show. Reason being that it's a pretty big topic, it's a new piece of hardware, and it deserves a great deal of discussion. So expect plenty more news coming out of CES and lots of content patch on that basis. In one of the most surprising announcements at CES so far this year, which is where most of the news is going to be coming from over the next couple of weeks, I would imagine, NVIDIA have actually announced that they are going to be releasing a handheld by the name, at least currently, of Project Shield. The handheld console features a full controller with double full-size thumbsticks, as well as all the buttons you would expect, an onboard sound system, as well as the Tigra 4 processor, which is their brand new quad-core designed for mobile devices. The machine is a clamshell design, which means that you've got a flip-up 5-inch screen, which is multi-touch and supports 720p resolution. The system also has the ability to stream PC games over your local wireless network to the device itself by utilizing the encoding capabilities of an NVIDIA 600 series card. So essentially it uses the NVIDIA Kepler encoder, which is on the video card itself, in order to do the dirty work and throw the video out to your actual handheld device. So what you've essentially got there is a cloud computing system, which they're choosing to call Grid, but it's designed for local use within the home. So you use your higher powered computer to then send the information to your handheld device. This thing also happens to have an HDMI out so you can plug it into a television and is even capable of displaying 4K video on a compatible display, which of course none of you own yet. Currently the machine does not have a price point as of yet and of course the design may very well by no means be final. Alright, well, let's discuss this thing, shall we? Because it was a surprise announcement, most people were not expecting it, and I certainly wasn't. So, I watched the NVIDIA press conference last night, and I looked at this thing, and I thought, hmm, it looks okay. And the first thing that I noticed about it was the fact that it actually has decent controls, which is something that is lacking in pretty much every Android device on the market right now, unless you count the Sony Xperia smartphone which I don't necessarily, because even that does not actually have the thumbstick design. What I also noticed is this thing is essentially the same size as a 360 controller. In fact, it is slightly bigger, so it's got all the functionality of a regular controller. It has the bumper buttons, it's got the triggers, analog of course. It also has the dual thumbsticks, D-pad, which nah, I don't necessarily like the look of the D-pad at the moment. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking... Ah, it's, it's not a raised D-pad, it's got this curve inward, I have a feeling that's not going to be so good for fighting games, and it might kind of suck for some platformers and 2D side-scrollers. And then I'm noticing the four face buttons, which look pretty good, as well as a number of useful buttons in the center there. I'm not personally all that worried about the speakers, in fact, actually, that's a feature I could very much do without in most handhelds, simply because that's very easily solved with headphones. T tends to drive the price up and, of course, takes up a bunch of space. They're claiming that the audio hardware in this is quite impressive, but I can pretty much guarantee that having a set of headphones on would make it much, much better. Now, this is what I believe when it comes to Android gaming. The problem that Android gaming, and it's the same as iOS gaming currently has, is that you have to design games with the notion that people are not going to have physical controls. And what that does is it shuts down a wide variety of genres. Now, you say, well, those games are on the iPad anyway, or the iPad iPhone or Android devices, what's the problem? Well, yes, they are, but they suck. That's the main problem. There's one of two ways to do it. Either you design the game in such a way that it uses touch and swipe controls, which in the vast majority of circumstances fails completely, or you design it in such a way that you have virtual controls on the screen, which means not only are you putting your fingers over the action, which makes it hard to see what you're doing, but virtual control pads absolutely suck. Now, as a result, what tends to happen is you've got these reinventions of particular genres. For instance, the Infinite Runner is a new genre upon the mobile device, 
for the most part, inspired by Temple Run, although there are, of course, other games that have done it in the past. And this takes advantage of the fact, or more to the point, compensates for the fact that you can't really do a really awesome platformer on those kind of devices without significantly dumbing it down. Even Rayman Jungle Run, which I think is probably the best example of a platformer ever released on a touchscreen device, still only uses one, essentially uses one button and it auto runs for you and it essentially just takes away all of the control it possibly can while leaving you with as much as possible without giving you these horrible on-screen controls. And it does a really good job of that. But that's still limited. That's very, very limited. It's extremely limiting. You've got real problems with the notion of doing first-person shooters, third-person shooters. Racing games can work if you're into the whole tilt controls. Personally, I find them rather obnoxious, and on most games, they don't work all that well. There are, of course, some exceptions. Any kind of 2D or 3D action game or platformer, those don't work all that well either. So that's a lot of genres. There are some that do. You can do turn-based strategy. To some degree, you can do real-time strategy, once again, as long as you redesign the interface. And there are a number of other genres which work, but you are massively limited in what you can make, which means that the majority of games on Android and iOS are terrible, because you can't build games within these established genres that have been in development for like the past 30 or so years as a result of restrictions in the UI and the way that you actually interact with the game. Now, if you were to have a device that allowed you to do that, whether or not it be the Ouya or whatever the bloody thing is called, Project Shield or a smartphone with some kind of proper tactile physical controls like the Xperia Play, then it is possible that you would see a lot of better games. And the reason that you would see them, of course, is that these things are actually kind of powerful now. I mean, hell, you can do N64 emulation on a lot of mobile devices. I can play Quake 2 on my phone. It's, it's obviously a terrible experience, but it actually runs pretty well. And these things have quite a lot of clout behind them. Of course, expect them to burn through their batteries pretty quickly, but that's just the cost of doing high fidelity gaming on the go like that. Now, if you get enough devices that use Android that have physical controls, then you inspire developers to actually create games that work that way, or at least adapt their existing titles to use physical controls. There are several games that I would definitely prefer to use physical controls with. One really good example, actually, is Super Crate Box, which is available on iOS. It's absolutely horrible to play with the touchscreen controls because that game requires quite a lot of precision, but if I stick that thing in my iCade and I use the analog stick on that, suddenly it actually feels pretty good. But obviously the iCade is completely impractical for normal gaming use, not to mention that it's a very jury-rigged solution. So I think that the solution to the Android problem, and there really isn't a solution to the iOS problem, platform because of course it's all completely locked down but the solution to the android problem when it comes to games is to have enough devices on the market with physical controls to actually inspire developers or incentivize them to make games with that in mind right now there aren't which means that developers are not creating games with that in mind they're creating games with the notion that they must be a good touchscreen experience I don't think there's a one-shot solution to this. I think you've got to have several different devices competing on the market. And as it turns out, that's actually what we're starting to see. We've got the Ouya coming out. We have the Game Stick. We've got Project Shield. And of course, it wouldn't surprise me to see more Android-focused mobile gaming devices or static gaming devices. It doesn't even have to be mobile. The Ouya is not a mobile device. It is a console. And if you get across the board a big installed user base because these things all use the same operating system and have fairly equivalent power, then you can inspire that kind of development. So this is a good thing. This is a really, really good thing for Android as far as I'm concerned. This is a good thing for mobile users in general. The more of these things we get, the better games are hopefully going to get on Android. Now let's talk about the PC side of it because that's the more surprising element of this thing. So PC streaming, the ability to essentially stream a game from your computer to the handheld anywhere in your house and play it in a hopefully lag-free manner. Now, when they demoed this, it didn't necessarily look like it was lag-free, but it is, of course, only a prototype, and when it comes to things on show floors, they don't necessarily perform all that well. I have seen many, many problems with devices such as that, so I would imagine they'll get that tightened up. Now, the notion, of course, that you need an NVIDIA card, well... 
it's natural that the people that would be interested in picking this up would be the guys that already had Nvidia cards to begin with. The fact that this will run on a 650 upwards, which is about, uh, that's a card that costs just over $100. So it's kind of the entry level gaming card that Nvidia are currently doing in the 600 range. So that would support it. And that card will run any modern game at 720p without too much of a problem that you shouldn't have an issue there. You may not be able to run it at maximum, but you can do it pretty damn close because honestly, 720p is not actually that high resolution, but it looks fine, of course, on a five inch display. The tech sounds good. It's the notion that you can do what OnLive can do, but you can do it with way lower latency with fewer concerns as regards to bandwidth. Yeah? Now, your average home internet connection, especially for a lot of people, does not actually have the download speed necessary to make it work. Your average Wi-Fi router, on the other hand, if properly configured, certainly does. Add into that the inherently lower latency of what's essentially a LAN, and you have a recipe for something that might actually work. The question one has to ask is where and why would you utilize this thing? If it is currently limited to your house only, and Nvidia did say that they were considering the notion of getting it to be able to stream over 4G and stuff like that so you could actually do it remotely and use your computer as a base station, if, for the moment, it's limited to your home, when are you going to use this to play PC games? What is the purpose of that? I'm thinking through a couple of scenarios, because lately I've played more games on my PlayStation Vita than I have played on handheld systems in many years. That's mostly because there are a couple of compelling titles that... I actually want to play them, and it's quite nice just to be able to you know, go to bed and play a little bit of Persona, or play a little bit of Need for Speed, or say, Stranger's Wrath HD, that's stuff that's available on the Vita. That's pretty cool. But I have to wonder, would I be playing stuff like Assassin's Creed 3? Would I be playing stuff like, I don't know, Battlefield on a handheld device? in my bedroom when I could just go to my office, which is a few feet away, and play on my PC? I don't necessarily see the point of that. Would I kick it over to the device if I suddenly needed to wander downstairs and maybe I was making food? Eh, potentially. I mean, if I needed to go downstairs and say, watch the chinchillas for an hour, but I still wanted to play XCOM or Assassin's Creed. Yeah, I mean, I could see the usefulness of it, but the question is, is it useful enough to really entice a lot of people? I think they at least do have something going for them in the sense that this thing does have a dual purpose. Uh, you could buy this thing as an Android console and that would be it. Yeah? You could play stuff like Shadow Gun and Dead Trigger 2. I mean, they're not very good, but you can play them anyway and you'd have a reasonably good time with it. Personally, I wouldn't buy the thing just for that. That seems kind of silly, but you would have a fairly enjoyable time with it. Now, if you throw the PC streaming in there as kind of a situational thing where you have this console and you suddenly think, you know what would be really cool if I was actually able to do that? Because you end up being in a situation in your house where you're forced to be away from your PC. And that's something that may very well happen for a lot of parents or people that are just generally busy around the house. Yeah, I could see that being kind of cool. I could also see myself sitting out in the sun on a hot day. Maybe not in North Carolina humidity, but if I were in a better place, then yeah, I could see myself sitting outside on a sunny day and playing a couple of PC games. Not exactly practical with my gaming laptop. <laughs> no, not at all. So I like it as a situational feature. It's like the notion that the PlayStation Vita can use remote play. Yeah, this is not new technology. You've been able to do this with a PSP and a PlayStation Vita for quite some time with the PlayStation 3 on limited titles. Like, I can play Tokyo Jungle on my PS Vita, streaming it via remote play, and there's a few other titles that work with it too. But you, you would never buy a Vita for that. That's insane. What you would do is have it as a nice additional situational feature that adds value to the package, but is not a huge selling point. So overall, it seems like it's got some potential, honestly. I kind of like the clamshell design. Some people don't seem to. I don't really have a problem with it. I also don't have a problem with sitting in an airport or whatever, what appears to be a gaming controller. I'm sorry, I'm not eight years old. I don't actually care what people think of me anymore. It's an interesting and exciting idea. The question is, of course, will it actually sell? That's the biggest limit on its potential success. One of these big flagship features of it only works if you happen to have an NVIDIA 600 series card. So your sales demographic is NVIDIA PC gamers with an interest in an Android handheld. Hmm. Well, you're limiting yourself a little bit there. 
So we'll see how it turns out. All right, folks, there you go. Thank you very much for watching the content patch. CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, is currently going on in Vegas, so expect plenty more exciting news and, of course, comment and discussion on the matter over the next few days of content patch. I will see you next time.